thank you for joining the Lakeside Light Podcast. It's light to help you see your way and a light version of our full televised Sunday services, which you can find on our website at lakesidechurch.org. This audio podcast is a weekly sermon message of intellectual, spiritual, and sometimes humorous nourishment for the road. Enjoy. Well, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, um, what with all of this sort of Easter Sunday and stuff happening around the end of March, I did not have the opportunity to tell you about a major milestone that happened in my household. Um, During Holy Week this year, uh, we mostly will, um, because I was less available, introduced our children for the first time to that sacred musical theater text. Jesus Christ Superstar by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. Now, watching JCS, as it's known for short, uh, now watching JCS during Holy Week makes a lot of sense. It is set in the days leading up to the crucifixion, right? But I gotta say, as I have prepared for today, Ascension Sunday, The lyrics of the opening song of Jesus Christ Superstar have been on repeat in my head. Uh, You may know the song. It is titled Heaven on Their Minds, right? In this song, Judas is struggling with tensions uh, between who he wants Jesus to be and who Jesus seems to actually be, right? This character of Judas is wondering if everyone is leaning into heaven too much, and if that means risking their earthly success. So at its climax, that's right, I'm gonna try and sing some of it. At its climax, Jesus, Judas sings, listen, Jesus, to the warning I give. Please remember that I want us to live. But it's sad to see our chances weakening with every hour, and then he sings, maybe in a different key. <laughs> All your followers are blind. Too much heaven on their minds. It was beautiful, but now it's sour. Too much heaven on their minds. Isn't it interesting that in today's passage from Acts, this ascension story that we read in the first verses of Acts, the disciples face almost exactly that same criticism again. Jesus is lifted into the clouds and the disciples are watching, they're gazing upwards, when suddenly, we're told in Acts, two men appear in white robes and stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? There's really no way around it, right? This is a very weird story, this ascension story. Uh, It's hard, for instance, to find a good image for the cover of the bulletin, right? Because you kind of don't want just like Jesus' feet dangling in the air. It feels weird. But without getting too caught up in what exactly Jesus is sort of floating into heaven looks like, the ascension does become an essential event in the lives of the disciples and in our faith story. It is a turning point, right? Jesus was with us. Jesus was then resurrected, but still with us as a resurrected Christ. And now... Jesus' physical presence is taken up. And the disciples have to grapple with a new reality. What will it mean to be Jesus' followers when he is no longer physically present? And along with grappling with that reality, they have been given this giant task, right? The one Kinsey talked about with the children. Jesus has told them that they will be witnesses in Jerusalem, 
in all Judea and Samaria, Jesus says, and to the ends of the earth. This is a huge task. Jesus is taken up, and they must begin their work as witnesses, and now they have to wonder how should they start. Well, say our two mysterious white-probed figures, first of all, why are you staring at heaven? I can't help it. Every time I read this text, every time I think about this text, I always think of the same illustration. It's the same game. Um, I've talked about this before, but it's been a minute. Um, it's this game that I used to play with our youth group a lot called Look Up, Look Down, Look. Maybe Madeline remembers that. Um, where you get in a circle. Some of you may have played this, but you, you get a whole bunch of kids in a circle or adults. You're all in a circle, and everyone is told to look up and then you look down, and then everyone is meant to look at someone in the circle. So you're, you're trying to look directly at someone else, but if somebody else is also directly looking at you, you scream, and the two who are looking at each other are out of the game, right? So the, the circle slowly gets smaller as you look up and you look down, and then if you make eye contact, you go, ah, and you have to step out of the circle until ideally it's an uneven group and you have one person. The idea is that you can't avert gazes. If you just look up, you're not playing the game. And if you just stay looking down, you're not playing the game. And if you're trying to sort of avoid looking at anyone, you're no fun at all, <laughs> right? The point is to meet someone's gaze. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean in our lives to neither look up nor look down, but to look? to look at each other, to meet the gaze of someone else, to look out into our world, to look into our community, our city, our nation, our world. What does it mean to be called not to look up, not look down, but look? So to some extent then, right, maybe Judas, as Tim Rice imagined him, had a point, right? There may be trouble in having too much heaven on our minds. Too much looking at heaven. But before we give that fictional critic too much credit, I do want to lean into another layer of today's Ascension text. Because the problem for those neck-craning disciples may not have been the heaven part, but the up part. Right? Perhaps Judas's true flaw, and again, we're talking about a character in Jesus Christ Superstar, as we do not really know the internal workings of the real Judas's mind, and, and we'll leave that thought project for another day. But maybe the real problem in Jesus Christ Superstar is Judas, in his thinking, is that he pits heaven against earth. As though the goals for God, as though God's goals for one could be in any way different from God's desires for the other. Judas says to put our minds to heaven means not putting our minds to earthly needs as though they could be separated. Once the apostles look down and look out, they hit the dirt roads toward Jerusalem, right? Throughout Acts, they look squarely into the eyes of beggars in need of healing, of curious bystanders, and of dangerous authorities alike. They face earthly realities in all their messiness and weakness and pain and joy, but, or and, they are undergirded by this deeply heavenly, royal idea of the ascended Christ. This Jesus we encounter in our Ephesians text today. A Christ who sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. It's this Ephesians text, by the way, that our Apostles' Creed references. This creed that would have been spoken by our earliest Christian forebears. This section from Ephesians is undeniably regal and heavenly at first blush. It seems very much to be looking up. Listen again to some of this passage. It was all one, by the way, one long Greek sentence, but in English we break it up a bit. Listen to this. I pray that you may perceive 
What is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to, his, to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Power and authority drip off the page. Which, so much of this moment we are living in tempts me to simply look up at the sky or, or down, honestly, a little navel gazing and nap, and a nap sound really good on Mother's Day for me. That would be great. But when I don't avert my gaze, when we look out and around, there are a lot of stories about power in our world. So many people struggle to be heard and seen, to be given any kind of power, and so many people are clinging to a power they perceive to be threatened. The trappings and realities of power drip off the front page. So I have to wonder, as followers of a Christ who sitteth at the right hand of God Almighty, whose rule and power and authority is above all, how are we, or are we, called to grapple with the power struggles of our day? From courtrooms to campuses to battlefields and borders, how are we called to be Jesus' witnesses? You may recall, if you were with us, but we walked alongside Peter through Lent, right? And we heard so many echoes of what the Judas of Jesus Christ Superstar also struggles with. There was then and there is now a temptation to ask Jesus to take on power the way our world seems to take on power. Instead of a Jesus who is dominated and killed, we want a Messiah with political strength, with the power of the state, the force of armies and police. But as we look at the Christ worthy of our worship, we see power lived very differently. Instead of power over, Emmanuel, right, means God with. Instead of beating down, God chooses to lift up. What does it mean to worship a power that does not beat down, but instead lifts up? New Testament scholar Sarah Henrik offers these thoughts on those last words of the Ephesians passage today, where Christ is the head of the church. Finally, she says, in these verses, we come to the mystery of our connection to God in Christ. Jesus Christ has been made head, or kephal, of all things for the church. This use of kephale can well be understood as source rather than authority, rather than head of staff or headmaster. Kephale makes more sense as the head in headwaters. It is the source from which flows all that he is, his body, the fullness of him which fills all in all. Jesus raised to God's presence is like the headwaters of the Mississippi that now expands to fill, shape, even become his people. On Mother's Day, perhaps we can imagine God's power as similar to the power of a loving mother, right? A power and source and authority that nurtures and lifts up a power that feeds us the way a headwater feeds its rivers and streams. As the reality of their ministry began to sink in for these apostles, 
this new world where Jesus' physical presence is no longer at their side the way it used to be. Two strangers appear at their side and tell them, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. If the apostles are truly to look for Jesus to appear in the same way they have seen him lifted up, then they should be looking for him among the dirty stables and contagious leper colonies, right? They should be looking for a lifting up that looks like healing a hemorrhaging woman or inviting a tax collector to sit at his table. They should look for a heaven on earth, one that appears in the most unruly and unworthy of places. And so should we. So let's look around us. And yes, let's do that with that kind of heaven on our minds. Let's face the power struggles and challenges of our day with heavenly hope, strengthened by our ruler, the one who nurtures and lifts up. And indeed, may all power and glory and authority and dominion be yours, O Lord, our headwater, our source, our mother, our Lord, and even our friend. Amen. The Lakeside Light Podcast is a copyrighted production of Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Visit our website at lakesidechurch.org for more information. Have a great week.